How's it going today, New Life? We're so excited to have you today with us. If we haven't gotten the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Taylor Duke and I have the privilege to be able to work with our 7th through 12th grade students here as the New Life Student Pastor. I want to share with you just a few of the many ways that you can get connected here. Our students leave for CIY this weekend. We're taking the high school students to Christ and Youth in Cedarville, Ohio for a week-long conference where they will get to learn more about a God who loves them, deepen their relationship with Jesus, and grow stronger together as a group. Please keep us in your prayers that God would do something powerful over this week that would change the years to come in their lives. This summer, there will be a men's Bible study on Thursday nights at 5.30 p.m. in the atrium. This free Bible study, Standing Tall, a study through the book of James, begins June 16th and will wrap up on Thursday, September 8th. All guys 16 years and older are welcome to attend. You can find more information and register for all of these events on our website, newlifenwa.com. And make sure to download our app to keep up to date on everything New Life by scanning this QR code with your smartphone. Again, we are so glad you joined us today. We're going to take communion together a little later in our service. So if you haven't grabbed your communion yet, you can go get it off the tables by where you came in today. Let's focus our hearts and minds as we prepare to worship our incredible God. Hey, let's stand as a church and let's worship him. He is a great God, worthy of worship, honor, and praise, church. Let's sing our hearts out to him today. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. Yes, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. Yes, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Yes, there is. We won't be quiet. No shout out. We're running free, but we are forgiven. 
Hey, I want to welcome all of you to church. If this is your first time with us. We're so glad you're here at New Life. Um, if this is your, it's your first time, there's a connection card on the seat back in front of you. If you've got a smartphone, you can take it out and scan that. It'll take you to a website, and uh, you can fill out an online connection card there. would love to get connected with you that way. Also, we take communion as a church every week. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we want to invite you to take communion or the Lord's Supper with us today. Just make sure to grab some bread and juice that's on the tables in the back of the room over the next few minutes if you haven't done that already. We're going to have a great time of worship tonight. Before we do that, we're going to celebrate a baptism. Let's have a seat for just a minute. Hi, this is Noel, and Noel is one of our students at the student ministry here at New Life, and she has decided that she wants to give her life to Jesus. And so I had the opportunity to get to sit down with her and her mom and just talk about this incredible decision that she wanted to make. And with that, she said, no, I'm all in. Let's do this. And so, Noel, I just want to ask that you repeat after me your confession. I believe... I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ the, Son of the, living God, the Son of the living God, and I declare him to be, and I declare him to be my, Lord and my, Savior. my Lord and my Savior. Amen. Because of that confession, I'm now going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It never gets old. Let's we'll stand up. Let's we'll continue in worship. Celebrate our Lord. We love you, God. We thank you for giving the greatest sacrifice for us. There's no one like you. No one could do what you've done, Lord. And you gave your life for mine. Nailed to the cross, you crucified all my sin and shame. It was washed by your mercy. Live my 
Thank you, Lord. All your ways are good. Here we are with bowed hearts in your presence, Lord. We love you.
beginning to end, Alpha and Omega. You always were, you are, and you always will be God. Always good, Lord. We love you so much. We praise you for who you are, for all you've done. Our Lord, amen. As their Savior, it means so much more. It represents so much more that this little piece of bread it represents Christ's body which bore our griefs which carried our sorrows this piece of bread represents his body which was crushed for our iniquities which was wounded for our transgressions and so as we take this little piece of bread remember what it represents it represents Jesus on the cross Jesus that day taking our spot remember that now with me And as we take this juice, which represents Christ's blood, which flowed out that day like a drink offering, we remember what this, what this juice represents. Jesus' blood washing away our sins, making us whole again, removing our sins from us. Take a moment and thank God for what this juice represents. God, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus going to the cross, taking our spot, doing something that we could never do. Lord, he didn't leave anything there. He gave it his all. Lord, he took, he took our punishment upon himself. Lord, in doing so, he saved us from our sins. And we thank you for that sacrifice. We thank you for what that means for us. And so, Lord, we, we thank you for your love and your forgiveness. and your Something you guys have been a part of now for several months is Christ in You, CIY. We are taking our students tomorrow night to Ohio for a week-long experience. And you guys have helped with prayers, with, with fundraising, with supporting our students. And so we are taking 58 people tomorrow night to Ohio, and we can't be more excited about what God is going to do over these next six days. So we want to ask that you just continue to pray for that. Be a part of that over these next seven days. And something else that you guys have been a part of that we just finished was an incredible week of our Make Wave Summer Experience. We filled this building, we filled this room with kids from our community. We got to tell them about the good news of Jesus and that they are loved and cared for. And we want to show you a quick recap of a little bit of what this week was like. Check out the screen.
How do you follow that? I don't know. Sadly, I missed most of VBS this week, and I apologize for having water up here with me. I don't like bringing water up here because I think it's a distraction when I have to drink it, but uh, I'm going to keep it up here because like Monday night, I got sick and pretty much just went home and like, I'm done. And then Tuesday, I was like, I'm in bed. I'm just feeling terrible. Wednesday, I felt so bad. I started having conversations with the Lord. Like, you know, we've had a good 46-year run, Lord. (laughs) It's okay. I think I've done everything you called me to do. And I'm good, I'm ready, let's go. And then uh, my wife's like, you need to go to the doctor. And I'm like, that's a good idea. Then the doctor gave me all kinds of medicine. And lo and behold, I'm feeling better. And um, so no COVID, nothing like that. Um, But um, um, apologize if I have a little bit of a coughing spell up here. That's what that water is for. And so I'm just gonna take things slow today. And um, and that may mean this goes on a long time tonight. (laughs) We'll get through it. Hey, we're in a series called Unearth, where we are exploring the world of biblical archaeology, and we're spending these few weeks together just uh, talking about and looking at some of these amazing artifacts that they have found over the years, artifacts that come alongside the Bible and actually support what the Bible says, and and it's like everything shows that this is actually historical, and it's reliable. You you can trust it, and it's just been amazing, I, and I hope it's been some, an eye-opener for you, and I hope it's given you a few defensive arrows in your quiver of how to defend your faith a little bit better than, than even before, um, and if you couldn't tell, I really love this stuff, okay? If that wasn't obvious, I, I love this archaeology. I'll tell you, I brought with me to the front um, something that um, it's not worth anything, but it's important to me because of where I got it and how old it is. But I'm holding up here a piece of pottery that it wouldn't mean anything to you, but this is 2,100 years old, by the way. It's a 2,100-year-old piece of pottery, and it came from an archaeological dig site called Tel Marisha in Israel, and um, it's an active archaeological dig site that the group that I was with in 2017 actually got to go and be a part of. So for a couple of hours and for a couple of bucks, you get to join some actual archaeologist on an actual dig site, and you get to spend some time kind of doing what they do and learning quite a bit about it. And it's kind of a touristy thing to do to be quite honest with you. I call it free labor for the archaeologist. But it's important work. And, um, and basically what we were doing, we were digging in what was, the, what I would say, the equivalent of what we would call a basement of a home today. So about 2,000 years ago, or a little bit longer, uh, this community was either run out or conquered, and, um, and then it was buried. So they just filled in all the home, that knocked over all the homes, filled in the basements and cave systems with dirt, and that's what we were doing. We were down below one of these ancient home ruins, and we were digging out the basement, and um, we would fill up our buckets, and we would pass them on up out of what felt like a cave to me, but up out, and then we would spend time sifting the the buckets looking for things, and most of the time we just found broken pieces of pottery. Basically, it's the equivalent of throw all your trash down there, then fill it up with dirt. And we were digging through the trash. That's basically what this doesn't archaeology sound fun? You know, you're digging through 2,100 year old trash. So we would find broken pottery, we'd find old uh, animal bones and things like that. Um, If my memory serves me correctly, Jackie Charles, you know Jackie Charles? She dug up this little awesome piece of pottery on that same day. Can you guys see that? Isn't that pretty cool? Uh, This piece actually caught the eye of our archaeologist um, because finding pottery where we're at with designs on it, well, that's a really rare thing. And, um, you know, we were allowed to keep some of the pieces of pottery. This was probably a part of a plate and uh, that somebody ate off of years ago. They did not let us keep that. That was too important, so we had to turn that in. And I'm like, Jackie, don't tell. Anyway, you just put that in your pocket. We paid good money to be here. No, I didn't tell her that. I'm kidding. I didn't tell her. We had another lady in our group that actually uh, found a small jar um, on our, this was awesome. This thing was awesome. Um, When that thing came up out of the dirt, we're like, whoa. And it was complete, it was intact except 
for the handle. The handle was broken off. And of course, the archaeologists were, you know, right away when they saw something like that. Because they're used to groups pulling up broken pieces of pottery, not complete pieces like this. And the archaeology that, archaeologist that was with us was looking at it. And she told our group, you know what? If the handle was still on it, if it wasn't broken, this would probably be studied, prepared, and shipped off to be on display somewhere. That's how good of a piece it was. So it was really, it's fun. When, when we take another group from New Life uh, to the Holy Land, we'll probably do something like this again. And um, if you guys are interested in something like that, just lock that away. Uh, I hope real soon we'll have some dates out there of some potential trips coming up. But uh, archaeology has a way of bringing the Bible to life, and that's what I want you to see and understand in this series of what it's doing. It can energize your faith, and I've told you how it energizes mine. It energizes my faith and your faith, hopefully, by reminding us that our, our faith, what we believe is grounded in truth, that you can actually see. And let's be honest, that's a really good thing. It really is. Because when you're talking about the Bible and you're talking about truth and can I believe this and having evidence for it, it's good because let's be honest, the Bible is the most attacked book in the history of the world. I've said that many times here, and I'm saying it again. The Bible is the most attacked book in the history of the world. And today, what I want to do is I want to highlight for you some examples of how the Bible has come under great attack um, over the years and some very specific attacks against the Bible and how biblical archaeology specifically has disproven or refuted those attacks on the Bible and, and basically created a complete reversal of position by the critics and how archaeology is still doing that to this very day. I think that the examples I'm going to show you here in a minute are going to be of great interest to you, great intrigue to you, but quite frankly, hopefully, I, I hope they're, they're inspirational for your walk with Jesus. That's what I want more than anything. Now, before I get to those examples, those very specific examples of how archaeology has debunked its critics, I want to say just a quick word about those people who criticize the Bible and who criticize Christians today. Uh, more specifically, the marginalization of our Christian values and our convictions and our principles which come directly from the Bible. I wanna say a word about that. To me, the disrespect shown towards the Christian faith in our country seems worse today than any other time in my life. That's what I think. And I don't think that's a shocking statement. I've said things like that very similarly here before, and I would imagine that a number of you would agree with that, that it seems like the disrespect leveled at Christianity today is worse than any other time in my lifetime. It seems like every acronym that you can think of in our country is on the uh, Criticize the Christian bandwagon train. That's what it, it feels like, every acronym. And all of it can create a lot of emotion, just to be honest with you. You know, I, I read what people are saying, and I, I see what many people are saying, and, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it angers me a lot of times. There's a lot of emotion that gets stirred, and I don't think you're any different than me. There are at times these days we can feel very much like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who would not bow down to the king's 90-foot-tall statue. Do you remember the story? Even though they were threatened with the fiery furnace, they told the king, they looked him right in the face, and they said, our God can save us. But even if he does not, we will not bow to your statue. I feel that emotion today, and I hope that many of you feel that emotion too at times. As a follower of Jesus Christ today, we are not going to bow down to the world's statues. We're going to stand up against, we're not going to stand or we're not going to bow. We're not going to bow. We're not going to bow to the statue of sexuality. We're not going to bow to the statue of LGBTQ. We're not gonna bow to the statue of identity. We're not gonna bow to the statue of marriage or the abortion statue or any other statue you wanna throw out there. Whatever it is, we will not bow. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I don't know, that's how I feel sometimes when I, when I think about the disrespect shown towards Christianity. And then there's other times, there's these days that we can also very much feel like Daniel, who upon hearing about the king's order that you can only pray to the king for 30 days, he didn't protest, 
He didn't make a scene. He didn't act like an obnoxious idiot. He didn't go to social media and make a fool out of himself. He didn't make God's people look foolish by what he said. No, he simply just stayed faithful, knowing that God is sovereign, that God's in control. And I very much feel that emotion a lot these days as well. And I hope you do too. So as a follower of Jesus, we are living in a world among people who do not fall in line with a holy God. And every time we turn around, there is something new coming down the pike right at us to challenge our faith. And whatever it is, we will remain faithful in a steadfast, daily, uncompromising walk with Jesus, just like Daniel did. So sometimes it's bold in public, and other times it's private and faithful. But either way, I just felt compelled to say that because I think we need a reminder from time to time that the marginalization of our Christian values and our convictions and our principles, the disrespect that we all feel shown towards our faith is nothing new. It's not. And we act like this is all, this is a brand new attack and I'm, I'm here to remind you as a church, this is nothing new. This should not be of any surprise to us. It may feel more intense these days. And there are new acronyms all the time. They've got something to say about what we believe. But it's the same old criticisms. It's the same old criticism. It's the same old assault on the same old source, which is this right here. So what we're talking about today and when people attack the Bible and, they're, and it feels like they're attacking us, really they are attacking what we believe about God's word. So I share with you again, I'll share with you again, the Bible is the most attacked book in the history of the world and critics have been trying to discredit the words of God since the very beginning of time. And if you don't believe me on that, just open up to the book of Genesis chapter three. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and God's words have been, there's been an attempt to discredit the things that God says. You look at Genesis 3, 1. What did the serpent say to Eve? He said to the woman, did God really say? Did he really say? Does this really say? Are these really God's words? Do you really believe them as God's words? Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Friends, listen, God's word has always been the target. None of this is new. This is not new criticism. This is not out of left field. The, you know, the, the names are different. The attackers have different faces and labels and colors. But listen, it's the same old attack on the same old source. And the attempt is to discredit what God says. Did God really say because I can tell you, if the word of God can ever be discredited, and I can tell you right now, it cannot be and it will not be ever, but hypothetically, let's just say, if they could be successful in discrediting God's word, then the Bible's claims no longer stand. And everything that's built on those claims, our highest values that set the Christians apart from the world, well, they will crumble. In a worldly system, that we live under will always be at odds with our Christian values. And our Christian values that are taught where? In the Bible. You tear down the Bible and you tear down everything that our faith stands upon. But that's never gonna happen. And I feel like I need to remind you of that today. It's never gonna happen. They've been trying to do it since the Garden of Eden and they have not been able to and they won't be able to. But what will continue to happen in our country, I fear, is this. We'll be continually marginalized for our convictions. That's going to happen. Ostracized for our beliefs. We're already seeing it. I believe that will continue. Pressured to abandon and conform. And I'm seeing that, I'm actually seeing that within the church at large, to abandon and conform to a worldly system. I think we'll be continually disrespected at every turn, and what I might say is on every news channel, I think we'll be continually disrespected and prejudiced against on many levels. That's what I 
think is going to continue to happen. I pray that we'll never see the level of persecution in our country that our brothers and sisters in Christ are seeing in other countries. In fact, what we are living under pales in comparison to what many others are living in this world. I pray we don't get to that level. But if we do, and no matter what level we find ourselves at, we need to remember the words of the Apostle Peter who said in 1 Peter 4, 16, if you suffer for being a Christian, don't be ashamed of it. But praise God that you bear his name. We need to remember the words of Jesus who said this in John 15, 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind, it hated me first. In other words, if you're coming under persecution, they hate this. This is what it is. It's this more than you. It's him more than us. So if the world hates, hates you, remember hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. He's talking about this worldly system. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. So please know that what we're talking about today, I'm not sharing anything new with you. Um, and In fact, even some of the examples I'm gonna share with you, they may not even be new to you. They might be new to a lot of you, actually. Um, but I hope that it'll inspire your faith. But be reminded, be grounded today. Criticisms of God's word. Man, they've been around much longer than any of us, and they will be here long after we are gone. Biblical archaeology is a field that continually refutes critics of God's word. Excuse me. Isn't this a distraction? I hate this. <laughs> but I like talking too, so that's good. Archaeological evidence... Um, like the artifacts that we've been examining together, um, they have been the reason why many of the Bible's harshest um, critics have had to do a 180 on their positions. And I'm gonna show you some, some great examples, but, but basically some educated person somewhere with a bunch of letters behind their name will make a claim about the Bible. And they'll make a, a very strong claim, like the Bible can't be true because of this. And they might say, because a certain individual or a certain town or a certain event that the Bible mentions is not mentioned anywhere else in history. Or it's not found anywhere else in history. And so they'll say, because it's only mentioned here in the Bible and not found anywhere else in the world, then obviously there's things about the Bible that aren't true. Because there's many people who believe that we have found the complete record of man out in the world. And that if the Bible says something that doesn't line up with that, then obviously the Bible's claims are false. Or they'll say that uh, the Bible embellishes people or they mystify stories, and they're not historical. However, what happens usually is that some dig site somewhere, new evidence comes to light, they dig up something that confirms the exact individual that they are critical of the Bible for, or the exact vent, or the exact town, or the exact location, and, um, and proving that they were wrong all along. Critics had to reverse their statements many times. So such is the case with the book of Daniel. Are you familiar with the Old Testament book of Daniel? Hopefully you are. I just referenced two events from the book of Daniel in the beginning, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fiery furnace, and Daniel in the lion's den. Both of those come from the book of Daniel. Do you know, or did you realize that for many years, nothing lately, but for many years, the book of Daniel was like the spotlight example for many Bible critics saying, the Bible, especially the book of Daniel, is baloney. Did you know that? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Um, they would say that because the stuff about the book of Daniel, if you've ever read it, it's full of prophecy. And it's very specific prophecy that all came true. And critics of the Bible would say this about the book of Daniel. There is no way some dude named Daniel living at the time of the exile wrote that. You know why they say that? They say that because it's way too specific. And because everything in it came true. So the criticism is, obviously, somebody pretending to be Daniel, hundreds of years later, after all of these things unfolded, wrote it, played it off on a bunch of people that didn't know any better, as 
holy word from God, and they bought it. That's the story, and that's what people have said, critics said, for, for lots of years. Now, the foundation, or one of the pillars that they rest this criticism on, it comes from Daniel chapter 5. And in Daniel chapter 5 is the, the very well-known story about King Belshazzar and uh, how he's throwing a, a feast. Let me just read it to you. Daniel chapter 5, verse 1, it says this. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with him. And while Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink for them. In other words, he's doing something extremely disrespectful to the Lord. All the holy goblets and instruments of the temple that was carried off into captivity during the exile, he's like, bring all that godly stuff of the Jews and let's get drunk off of their cups. I mean, if you just wanna thumb your nose at God and say, I dare you to do something. Oh, wait a minute, we do that in our country every day. So that very night, Belshazzar saw a human hand show up and, and even through their drunk eyelids, they could tell, oh my, this, this is something happening. A, a hand wrote a message on the wall, and nobody was able to interpret it. And they called for Daniel, because they heard he had a knack for this kind of stuff. And they called for him to interpret it. If you jump all the way down to Daniel chapter 5, verse 28, Daniel comes and, and he reads his inscription. And says, this is the inscription that was written, meaning, meaning, Tekel Parson. Here's what these words mean. Mean means God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persian. This is where we get the famous statement today. Has anybody ever said to you, well, the handwriting's on the wall. <laughs> Daniel 5, this is where we get that, by the way. Daniel goes on to tell us that very night, King Belshazzar is killed and the city of Babylon is passed over into the hands of the Persians. And for years, critics have said, no, nah, uh-uh, didn't happen. No, no, Daniel 5's phony baloney. Somebody's trying to pull the wool over your eyes because, anyway, first of all, the story seems outlandish to a non-believer. But then the, the reason they say that is because they said, whoever wrote Daniel made up some guy named King Belshazzar. That, that's the criticism. They said, Belshazzar is pure invention. If, 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 historical blunder. So the naming of Belshazzar as the final king of the Babylonian empire to critics said, that proves to us, whoever wrote Daniel didn't know what they were talking about. See, Belshazzar is not mentioned in the historical records of the Babylonians. They thought they dug it all up already because the, the last record of any king um, in, in Babylon is King Nabonidus. So they're like, so whoever wrote the book of Daniel didn't know his history. And he made up some guy, Belshazzar, and he should have known that King Nabonidus is the last king. I love what James Boyce wrote in his commentary from the book of Daniel. He said this. If you want to look very wise in the world's eyes and are willing to risk looking foolish years from now, you can make a reputation for yourself by pointing out the errors in the Bible. But things tend to become explained. As time passes and the data from archaeology, historical investigation, pneumostatics, which is the study of coins, and other disciplines accumulate these alleged errors tend to explode in the faces of those who propound them. And boy, did this one ever blow up in people's faces. It blew up in people's faces when they discovered what is known as the Babylonian Chronicle Tablets. Currently, this tablet behind me is on display in, the, in a British museum, and it tells about King Nabodinus, the last king of Babylon, and and how towards the end of his reign, he departed on a multi-year trip across the, to the Arabian oasis town of Timnah. It's about 450 miles away from Babylon. And in his absence, this stone, this tablet, right? There's a clay tablet behind me, says this, that he entrusted his eldest son, Belshazzar, to lead in his absence. And there it is. Right there, unearthed on an actual archaeological dig site, 
And right there, Belshazzar, his name is written right there. Oh, but it gets better than this. Because they discovered something else. In, the, uh, in, in Iraq, in, in the old city of Ur, they, they found this cylinder, this clay cylinder. And uh, there should be a picture of it behind me. It's this clay cylinder. There it is. And it actually records the prayer of King Nabonidus. And he's praying for his son, Belshazzar. And his prayer is for his son, Belshazzar, my offspring. And this prayer is given to the moon god, ironically named Sin. So he's praying to the god Sin about his son, Belshazzar. So as it turns out, Belshazzar was in line for this, the last king of Babylon. He was the co-leader on the very last day of the Babylonian empire, co-ruler with his father um, who was away. Not only that, not only that, but these two um, artifacts explain a detail that, that uh, biblical scholars could not explain until they found this. And it's in, in Daniel chapter 5 verse 16. Um, Belshazzar calls in Daniel and he says this to him. Now I've heard that you're able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you'll be clothed in purple and you'll have a gold chain placed around your neck, which if you know anything about Daniel, that's all he ever wanted in life, right? Purple and gold chains. <laughs> Daniel actually said, no, you keep it. And then he says this, and I will make you third highest ruler in the kingdom. It's always kind of puzzled uh, scholars. Third highest kingdom. Well, because they unearthed these two artifacts, making Daniel third makes perfect sense now. And explains a detail. Well, he couldn't give him the second because that's what he was. And he can't give him first because that's what his dad was. So the highest position that Belshazzar could even offer to Daniel is third. And all of a sudden, it's like light bulbs goes off. That makes perfect sense. So not only was Belshazzar a real person and a real king, but it shed light onto this detail that had baffled people for years. Oh, that's why he's third highest. Because Belshazzar was co-leader when it all went down. Isn't that amazing? And every critic in that day when this happened, shut up. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> they stopped being so critical of the book of Daniel. Because that's what happens when you start criticizing the Bible, give it enough time, and God will work it out for you in irrefutable ways. Friends, this is just one of many examples of how the Bible, how the Bible shows itself to be true and trustworthy and reliable. Can you handle another example? I got another one. I'll use up my voice tonight and we'll just play the video tomorrow. How's that? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm good. The picture behind me is of King David and um, most people in the Bible recognize King David. I think most of us would acknowledge in this room, I know who King David is. Um, famous for his David versus Goliath account. Um, um, he was the focus of one of my sermons during the botched series um, when, with his sin with Bathsheba. You know, he reigned in Israel for, for 40 years. He was a man after God's own heart. He wrote many of the Psalms. I mean, this is that David. I mean, he is, he's famous. You visit Jerusalem today, and there's a part of the city um, where Jerusalem first started called the City of David. And a lot of people just reference the whole city of Jerusalem as the City of David just sometimes. That's, you can't go anywhere without hearing about David in the Holy Land. The picture behind me is, uh, is uh, the famous sculpture by Michelangelo that he made between 1501 and 1504. And um, can't show you the bottom half for obvious reasons. But anyway, <laughs> the screen's a little too big for that. So um, anyway, Saturday night. <laughs> Wouldn't dare say that Sunday morning. <laughs> this is gonna surprise you, I think. That did you know that before the year 1993, the evidence for David's life outside of the Bible was virtually non-existent? I mean, everything we know about David comes from the Bible. Very, very little, none really, from archaeological evidence. Josephus is a first century historian that wrote a little bit about King David, but he wrote about him over a thousand years after David lived. It's not really considered archaeological evidence. Did you know that? That before 1993, there was really no archaeological support for the life of David. In fact, David, for a lot of years, has been the target, a big target, 
of Bible critics. Uh, Philip Davies is one of those. He's a former professor at the University of Sheffield in England, and he said this, and I'm going to quote him. King David is about as historical as King Arthur. That was his assessment. Number of critics, they thought this way about David. David was nothing more than a figure of religious and political mythology. In other words, it's convenient stories to drive home the points you want to make. That's, that's all that David was for a lot of people. Well, that criticism took a huge hit in 1993 when a 3,000-year-old stone slab was discovered in the ruins of the ancient northern city of Israel uh, in a city called Dan. And the inscription on the slab mentions the king of Israel and the king of the house of David. And this is considered to be a top 10 archaeological discovery of all time. By most archaeologists, they say, what's your top 10 biggest discoveries? This will be on that list, I promise you. It's because it helped verify for the very first time in an ancient text outside of the Bible, so somewhere besides here, that verifies that David and his rulership and his kingdom was actually real, that he was a historical figure. I actually got to visit the ruins of Dan. I got a picture I'll show you. I took this picture. This is where that inscription was found. If you guys can throw that up there. Fascinating place. Absolutely fascinating place. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, it was cool to be there. The very place where this stone slab was found. And, and you can go look it up on how they found it. It was secondary construction. It was torn down from something else and used and how they found it. It's, it's, it's really remarkable. They, they've discovered, archaeologists have discovered that uh, when they come to roads, ancient roads, that if they'll dig up a block and flip it over, a lot of times they find stuff. Because it's broken pieces of other things and they just like, well, this side's got writing on it, but this side doesn't. Bury it, make a road out of it. They're not thinking about the large archaeological significance 3,000 years later. So they're finding stuff by just flip, literally turning over stones, you know, and they're finding stuff. So this was secondary construction. And um, this was such a huge find that even um, Time Magazine wrote about it. And this is what Time Magazine said. The skeptics claim that King David never existed is hard to defend. The skeptics claim that King David never existed is hard to defend. Time Magazine. Jeffrey Schell, a reporter for U.S. News World Report, wrote this about the discovery at Dan. He said, the fragmentary reference to David was a historical bombshell. Never before had a familiar name of Judah's ancient warrior king, a central figure of the Hebrew Bible, and according to Christian scripture, an ancestor of Jesus, been found in the records of antiquity outside the pages of the Bible. Skeptical scholars had long seized upon the fact to argue that David was a mere legend. Now at last, there was material evidence, an inscription written, catch this detail, not by Hebrew scribes, but by an enemy of the Israelites a little more than a century after David's presumptive life. It seems to be a clear corrobor corroboration of the existence of King David's dynasty and by implication of David himself. So these are like two slam the door in the face of Bible critics examples right here where archaeology proved Belshazzar was a real person. Archaeology proved that David was actually a real prison, a person. And time and time and time again, that's exactly what the Bible does. I'll give you one more example tonight. If you grew up in church, then no doubt one of the Sunday school lessons that you were taught as a kid was the story of Jericho. Now, how many of you learned that as a child growing up in church, story of Jericho? Certainly one of my favorites growing up. Uh, we learned about that in the Old Testament book of Joshua, chapter six. Jericho was the city that God told the Israelites to march around. And then the wall, after, after, <clears throat> excuse me, after seven days in a row, the walls fell down and God delivered the city to them. So in, in Joshua chapter six, verse one and following, it says this. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because, the, because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have the seven priests carry trumpets of rams, horns, in front of the ark. 
And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear the sound, a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, and the wall, the city will collapse, and the army will go up, everyone straight in. And many Bible critics have looked at this story over the years, and they're like, "Mm, no, that sounds too good to be true. Walls don't just fall down. Cities don't fall with no fighting. That didn't happen. This is a fortified city, one of the best in the ancient world. And, and they claim that the Bible just embellishes the story. Once again, archaeology proves the details of the Bible to be very accurate. I had lunch in Jericho one time when I was there in the Holy Land. Oddly enough, as I think back on it, Jericho was not... Um, on our itinerary to go to, but we had a little bit extra time, and so we made a quick detour through Jericho for lunch. Now, how many times do you say that? Oh yeah, we stopped in Jericho for lunch. Well, we did. We stopped in Jericho for lunch. I think maybe some of that had to do with the fact that uh, they wanted to uh, let us have lunch in what in today's world is understood to be the oldest continuously habitated, habitated, that's not a word, Inhabited, gosh, I'm not feeling great. <laughs> inhabited city in the world. Did you know that's what Jericho is considered? The oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. So how often do you get to have a lunch in a place like that? So on our way out of the city, our tour guide said, hey, if you look out the side of the bus, you will see the ancient ruins of Jericho. And I'm like, stop the press. Let's go there. And we didn't have time, unfortunately. And our tour guide, I remember him saying to, to us, he said, well, there's not really anything to see there anyway. Well, to the tourists, that's probably true. But to me, there's quite a bit to see there because I know quite a bit about Jericho. And, and I knew we didn't have time. I didn't make a fuss about it. But I wanted to give you a little perspective from the picture. This is our bus. And we're looking out at Jericho. This right here is, the, is, the, is Jericho. Okay, this area right here. I want you to get some perspective. We're not talking about a huge place. Um, and, and like a lot of archaeological uh, places in the Holy Land, it's all, it's all been buried. And, and what you might look at as a hill might hold four or five ancient civilizations down in the dirt. That's Jericho. And so you're looking at, at this place. Here's what it looks like from the air. And this will give you a little bit more, a little bit better perspective. So what you just looked at from the bus is this area here. So this is, this is Jericho today. Okay? Not, not a huge place. You can easily walk around Jericho in less than an hour. And that's a leisurely stroll. You know, sometimes people say, how in the world can an army march around an entire city seven times in one day? Because they're not marching around Kansas City. They're not even marching around Bentonville. Yeah, I think Jericho's six, seven acres. I think that's the size. Um, so they march around this place. And it says in Joshua 6.20, <coughs> when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when, when the men gave a loud shout, the walls collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. Um, let me just quickly tell you what archaeologists have found there at Jericho. They, they've, been, they've been working on this site since the 1860s, so it's not new excavation. Uh, but they've been making discoveries all along the way, some very significant ones. They found here at this place collapsed walls. In fact, they've discovered all the way around the city, the, the mud brick wall that used to be there fell down. And uh, this archaeologist in this picture is Dr. Bryant Wood. He's got a ton of stuff, ton of videos on YouTube. He's one of the leading experts in Jericho. He's actually a leading expert in Canaanite pottery. Can you imagine? What do you do for a living? I study Canaanite pottery, ancient Canaanite. Anyway, he's a foremost expert in it. And, um, and, and he's an expert in Jericho. And what he's pointing at, it's hard to tell just unless you've really dug into this. But this is a buried wall that fell down, and it fell down this embankment. So in other words, the wall fell and went all the way down the city in one instance. And, 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 and they found it. And what he's pointing to, you can't really see it very good in this picture, but he's actually pointing to, to bricks that fell from the wall that were buried and uh, basically created a ramp all the way up into the city, um, which, which is awesome. 
So the evidence is that the, the, not only is the evidence for a collapsed wall, and nobody refused that the walls all the way around the city fell down all at once. That's not, that's not even refutable. What they fight over is the date. Secular scholars will say, oh, that happened much earlier than when Joshua ever showed up, but nothing of that makes sense. They can't prove that. But what all makes sense is that this happened when Joshua showed up in the Israelite army. And so basically, what does the Bible say? The walls fell down and everybody went up and straight in. Well, if you look at it, even back then, it was built on a mound, and it was a doubled wall uh, fortress, basically, and they were down below, and they were marching around, and all the walls fell down, and as the bricks all fell down the hill, it made a perfect ramp right up into the city, and they went straight in, just like the Bible says, and that's what the archaeological evidence shows. There's also evidence of a huge fire that leveled the whole place. In fact, in Joshua 6, 24, it says they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. So they have carbon-14 dated uh, charcoal, fire remains from Jericho, and it came back to the year 1410 B.C., right when Joshua was supposed to be there, plus or minus a few years. There's also evidence that the destruction happened during harvest time, which is exactly what the Bible says. If you read the few chapters before, they, we know what time of year it was. And the reason why they know that this destruction happened during harvest time is because they unearthed all of these large jars full of seed and harvest product from the wheat. In fact, all over this, they found large, and they were still, all these years later, full of grain that was stored in this city. Now, what does that tell you? It, t- it tells you that, uh, that uh, this was not a long siege, was it? This was a short siege. Because if the Israelites had camped out for years trying to, to, to starve them out, they would have eaten all the food. No, no, no. Jericho's loaded with food. This was a short siege. And they found uh, untouched sacks of wheat, barley, dates, lentil, food that would have been eaten up had this been a long event. No, this was a seven-day event right after harvest. That's pretty awesome. Evidence that the Israelites were not allowed to use anything from the city. Now think about it. If you know the story well, God told them, don't plunder the city. Don't take anything. Just take the gold, silver, and bronze. You leave everything behind. Why in the world would an army leave behind such valuable food? Because God told them to. And you might remember, Achan didn't obey, did he? And well, you catch up in him in the next chapter. This is the really remarkable detail. They have found on the north side of the city, the part that faces the hills, they found a section of the wall that did not fall down. And, and you can go online and see pictures of this and the ruins of houses that built right up to the wall. Well, who might have lived there? Rahab. Rahab. She was spared. Now, I won't retell the whole story, but isn't that interesting? Archaeology is digging up these facts, these, this archaeological evidence that lines up perfectly with the Bible to the very part where one little piece of the wall didn't fall down where the houses were, and that was probably Rahab. Probably not probably, it was. Friends, the attacks on God's word started in the Garden of Eden when the serpent said, did God really say And people have been saying the same thing for all of these years. These attacks have never stopped. And I don't suppose that they ever will. The archaeological discoveries that we've looked at in the three weeks of this series so far um, is just a really small sample of what really could be thousands of examples, both big and small. Thousands of artifacts that have been unearthed over the years that, that um, have led so many people, including myself, to view what's written in this book as true, as reliable history. It's a reliable record of events and people and places. And, and if the Bible continually is proven true in all these places, then... I'd be a fool to not believe all of it. My understanding is that um, even with all these amazing archaeological discoveries, that right now in the Holy Land, 
it is estimated that they have unearthed less than 1% of the potential material that is holding in the ground right now even more discoveries. In fact, everything I've read seems to indicate that everywhere they're digging, 99% of it is still yet to be discovered. What do you think they're gonna find? In the 1% they've dug up, all of it verifies the Bible. What will the 99% dig up? Who knows what they're gonna dig up? I'll end with this. In Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, talks about Jericho and it talks about Rahab. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. Okay. So there's a New Testament referring to an Old Testament event. Right there in that mound I've shown you pictures of. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. And I, I wonder, had Joshua told God, I'm not marching my people for seven days around that city. There'd be no faith. Joshua still had to accept what God said. He had to believe God's words. And after the people had marched around them for seven days, this is verse 31, by faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. At the end of the day, it still all just takes faith. You can have all the evidence in the world, but it still takes faith. And we can dig up everything there is to know in Jericho. It still takes faith. And it was faith that led to the destruction of that city. It was faith that led to Rahab's saving. It was faith. And friends, no different for us today. It will be your faith that Jesus lived, he died, and rose again, that you will be saved. It is by faith that you believe these things, that you will adjust your life. It is by faith that you live by godly priorities. It is by faith. Let me pray for you. Lord, we give you thanks. I thank you, Lord, that so much has been preserved for us. And Lord, I, I pray that we don't take it lightly. I pray, Lord, that we take it seriously. That, Lord, we believe that these things have been preserved for a reason. The reason would be to point glory to you. So, Lord, I pray that's what we've done here. I pray we've looked at things that were thousands of years old and pointed all the glory back to you. I pray, Lord, you help us when our faith is weak and that you will use things like this to help build up what in our, our heart we want to believe, but maybe our mind just needed to come alongside of our heart, Lord, and have some evidence. Lord, I pray there's not a one of us in this room today that would ever doubt that the word of God is true and that the things that you say in there are true. And Lord, if, if the word of God is true and the words of your son Jesus are true, then just how much more important is it for us to believe them? So Lord, we thank you for all your help in this. Lord, we thank you for the way you're shaping us through this. And we pray, Lord, we continue to just be that piece of clay in the hands of a great potter. And that potter be you. We pray you make us and mold us and shape us in the way that you would have us to go, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing. I've got a friend Closer than a brother There is no judgment Oh, how he loves me I've got a friend And he is my strength And he is my portion With me in the valley With me in the fire with me in the storm Let all my life testify Hallelujah We are not alone God really loves us God really loves us 
Father, thank you that we have a friend in Jesus, and we can trust in the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, go be blessed.